The Department of Sociology and Anthropology is very pleased to host this chapel in memory of Dr. Ivan Foz. Ivan was known as an energetic, engaging sociologist who believed in connecting all levels of, of society. Excuse me. He was known for his uh, research with students and on homeless issues. Uh, I think he was responsible for DuPage Pads, which is a ministry locally around the college. And he did many important things, like sleeping in Chicago overnight with students to uh, observe the homeless directly. Well, in memory of his legacy, in memory of his life, we have asked Dr. Alvaro Nieves, Professor Emeritus of the Sociology and Anthropology Department, who taught here, I believe, six, 26 years? 26? 28, excuse me. 28 years to uh, speak to us today. And I've been asked to sort of summarize my friend Al. I've known him for 30 years. We met in November of 1983. And when I think of Al, I think of the following sort of quick description. Number one, he's a man of great conviction. He believes that sociology, he believes that Christianity is a tool to do good. The chaplain opened by saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to reclaim release of the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That is the conviction that Dr. Davis has. He also is a man of courage. He's a man of compassion. He's a man of godly character. So because my time is about up, I present to you my good friend, Dr. Al Nieves. Let me begin by saying what a great pleasure it is to be back at Wheaton with you for a short while. It, 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 uh, I suspect that uh, many of you, when you graduate, will come back a few years later and things will seem a bit strange. And I can understand that a little bit better now. It, it seem, seems a little strange to walk on campus, but then as you walk around a bit, things become familiar again, and your memories come flooding back. It's a great pleasure to be back after a number of years, and I want to thank especially Chaplain Kello and Dr. Allen for inviting me here today. And uh, I want to give special thanks to the, all many people behind the scenes who sometimes go unrecognized and unmentioned, but I want to thank especially uh, uh, Jean Doty from our Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and also Marilyn Brenner from the Chaplain's Office. Because in reality, I know that those are the folks that do all the work, <laughs> and without whom they don't get things done. And we wouldn't be here if, if it weren't for, for folks like that. So it's time that, uh, for me at least, to, to make sure that I make that recognition explicit. Let me begin by reading from chapter 58 in the book of Isaiah. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Tell my people Israel of their sins, yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to hear my laws. You would almost think this was a righteous nation that would never abandon its God. They love to make a show of coming to me and asking me to take action on their behalf. We've fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have done much penance and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why. It's because you are living for yourselves even while you are fasting. You keep right on oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like a blade of grass in the wind. You dress in sackcloth and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No. The kind of fasting I want calls you to free those who are wrongly imprisoned and to stop oppressing those who work for you. Treat them fairly 
and give them what they earn. I want you to share your food with the hungry and to welcome poor wanderers into your homes. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. If you do these things, your salvation will come like the dawn. Yes, your healing will come quickly. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. During the nearly three decades that I taught here at Wheaton, there were times which I received less than universal acceptance, approval, or adulation. I think many of you will attest to that. There were some who thought I was too aggressive, too loud, too liberal, or all three. Such characteristics were seen as less than ideal in our environment. I think I've improved in the years I've been gone. Now I'm perfectly content to be seen as liberal, progressive, radical, even revolutionary. For me, this is real and positive growth. Let me explain. To be liberal is to seek the protection of those whom Jesus called the least of these. To be progressive is to look to the future. To be radical is to be grounded or rooted and reaching to the center of the ultimate source, which is our creator. To be revolutionary is to change, is to seek to change the status quo in the direction of greater justice for all. In this, I found myself in humbling company the company, for instance, of the constructive revolutionary, John Calvin, or the radical Wesley. In the last few years, I've come to believe more strongly than ever that God, through the word, calls us to inclusiveness and justice, and that's a radical call. It is unfortunate that early in the 20th century, the response of Christians to the abuses of industrialism came to be seen and rejected as a purely social gospel with an ensuing attempt to separate the social from the spiritual, the social from the gospel. The radical Wesley said, well, I think he would not have approved. In the preface to his hymns and sacred poems, in 1739, he wrote these words, the gospel of Christ knows no religion but social. I repeat that. The gospel of Christ knows no religion but social. No holiness but social holiness. According to the author Graham, who wrote the biography of John, one biography of John Calvin, said that in the mid 1600s in Geneva, the church under Calvin, who sometimes was known as the unofficial Bishop of Geneva, was not content to have its weight felt in the social arena solely through the efforts of good people acting as individuals. Instead, church and state cooperated as one in concern for the poor because of the efforts of people like John Calvin. Now, Peter, in the second chapter of Acts, responds to criticism. You remember the, you remember the story. It's the day, of, the day of Pentecost, that original Pentecost experience. And, 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 and the people were criticized because they, people thought they were drunk on new wine. And Peter gets up and he preaches to the crowd and he cites the the, the prophet Joel in those words. He says this, listen carefully, all of you. Fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. Some of you are saying that these people are drunk. It isn't true. It's much too early for that. People don't get drunk by nine o'clock in the morning. No, what you see this morning was predicted centuries ago by the prophet Joel. And hear these words of Joel cited by Peter. 
In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit upon all my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The post-Pentecost possibilities are incredible. They relate to power the power of the Holy Spirit, and changes in power. The possibilities are revolutionary. The Spirit empowers changes in the social structure that are egalitarian and inclusive. Think back to that section of Peter when he was citing Joel. The Spirit is poured out on all people. There are no exclusions. Sons and daughters no gender discrimination. Young men and old men, no age discrimination. Let me tell you, I'm getting to the point where that's an important consideration. (laughs) Slave, no age discrimination. Slave owners and slaves, men and women, no class discrimination. What are the ramifications of such inclusiveness? It is this sense of inclusiveness that opens up the ministry to Gentiles. Paul comes along later and follows through on what has been prophesied. Not without difficulty, I might add. It subsequently, subsequently, in fact, brings him into conflict with Peter. You read about it in Galatians, second chapter of the 11th to the 16th verses, so much so that Paul talks about getting in Peter's face. Don't think he'd use that language, but he did. Read it for yourselves and you'll see. Paul refuses to cave in to the cultural and the political demands of the Judaizers and the circumcision party and kept the path open which would spread the gospel beyond the narrow confines of Jerusalem to all of the then known world. I think it's important that we recognize the lessons from this post-Pentecost experience. The more exclusive we are, the more we build walls or circle the wagons, the more we exclude the other, the less effective we will be in every area of ministry. Consider these words of challenge by Alice Walker, Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist that some of you probably know for her novel, The Color Purple, it was also a movie. But she wrote these words. She said, our last five minutes on earth are running out. We can spend those minutes in meanness, exclusivity, and self-righteous disparagement of those who are different from us, or we can spend them consciously embracing every glowing soul who wanders within our reach. Those who, without our caring, would find the vibrant, exhilarating path of life just another sad and forsaken road. I've found it both instructive and interesting to read about Jorge Bergoglio. Jorge Bergoglio. You know that name? I don't think you do. Some of you do. Anybody know that name? Jorge Bergoglio. You may know him as Pope Francis. The first pope, in fact, to take the name Francis, wishing to honor and model St. Francis of Assisi, who you probably have heard of. The new pope has indicated that the church must recognize, and I quote here, the greater need to make it a merciful, more welcoming place for all. He went on to say the church must be concerned with going out to find those who have been hurt excluded or have fallen away, and the ministers of the church must be ministers of mercy above all. 
Does that speak to us today in whatever circumstances of church and whatever experience of our Christianity we are presently walking in? Pope Francis is refusing much of the luxury usually associated with his office, and he's choosing to live and model that much more humble lifestyle. He's shown a pastoral side that is accepting of many who, who were previously rejected. In homilies at World Youth Day in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, he specifically took note, he said, of the yawning gap between the very rich and the desperately poor the gap between the very rich and the desperately poor. When I preach, it's hard for me to get away from the words of the prophets, and I, so I go to one that's familiar that you'll probably take away with you because you're familiar with it. Micah, sixth chapter, the eighth verse, you're familiar with, with it, I'm sure. God says, Prophets, Micah says about God, he said, you know what, you know what, re what Yahweh requires of you to do, do what? To do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. To do what? To love and to walk humbly with God. That's just a test to see whether we still had some people awake. Yeah, I spent a lot of time here, so I'm, I'm familiar with. It's, it's, a good, it's a good tactic, don't you think? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I want to tell you that Jews look at that verse from Micah and they see in it not just the, the words that I read, but they see it as a covenant guide for living in community. A guide for living in community. Megan McKenna wrote, wrote the book Prophets, Words of Fire, says this about it. Do justice means to be faithful as God is faithful, holy as God is holy to set those in bondage free, to hear compassionately the cries of those in slavery, to do for one's neighbors what God has so graciously done for you. It is only by doing acts of justice, by solidly standing with those in need of justice, and by resisting injustice that justice can become a reality chapter that I read in 58th chapter of Isaiah, the portion talks about this insincere worship and fasting and says that with that insincere worship and fasting, God was not impressed. And what he talks about is about what God really requires, that idea of doing justice. What does it mean? Stop oppressing those who work for you and all the other things that, that, that I read in that passage. Now, the interesting thing is when people think about justice, too often we think of, we, we fail to recognize that there are, there are several different kinds of justice. The two main ones that I want to talk about just very, very briefly, I just want to mention, one is called distributive justice, and the other is called retributive justice. Retributive justice is easy to get a handle on. It's what you do when you do something wrong, you get punished for it. That's retribution. Okay. The other part of it is distributive justice. And it may be a more important and more difficult aspect because it says, in effect, when I do something right and I'm rewarded for it, what do I do with the rewards? How do I share those rewards? To what degree am I willing to share those rewards? Who gets the benefit of rewards in our society? That's what distributive justice is about. And you can read a lot about it, especially I'm sure you hear about it in the, in, in, if, you, if you've taken courses in the econ department here and you talk about economics and, and, and the distribution of wealth. And one of the things that we discover is that there's a growing, and you read about this even in the newspapers today, 
what's called the growing income inequality, the growing inequity, the growing gap between the rich and the poor, even between the middle, middle class and the very rich. And those are things that speak to issues of distributive justice. Now, what I've discovered as I've been reading, and it's been a great thing about retirement, I've, I've been able to read things I hadn't been able to read before. And I know that all of you will do that when you have the opportunity and you're not forced to read for assignments, you'll, there's a lot you'd like to read. And I've been reading fiction and nonfiction and history and theology and all kinds of things that I never had time for. And it's been, it's been a blessing. But in retributive justice, let me say this, that there's an element of distributive justice in how we distribute retribution. And I want to suggest to you a book that I know Dr. Allen's familiar with and has used in classes. It's written by Michelle Alexander, and it's called The New Jim Crow. And what Michelle Alexander talks about is the disparities that exist in terms of how we enforce justice in our criminal justice or criminal injustice system. And we need to be aware of that because it's easy to assume that people are doing wrong, they ought to be punished, and that's all well and good, but we need to make sure that that punishment is distributed appropriately. That, for example, whites who are being punished are being punished in the same way that black and brown men are being punished. And yet all you need to do is to go to a prison or a jail and you discover that the distribution is not equal. I want you to be aware of those things. Also, when you look at, at income and wealth statistics in our country today, we see great gaps and growing inequality. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. frequently used a quote which he's often credited for, for having written, but he didn't, and it's a quote you're familiar with. He said this, he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Actually, those words were written right after or right before the end of the Civil War by Theodore Parker. Martin Luther King Jr. was so impressed that he picked that up and he used it repeatedly in, in his sermons and his speeches, and it came to be associated with him. But the thing that I want to suggest to you is this, we all pray that this is true, that that ark is bending toward justice. But in fact, we've got to realistically recognize that the wealthy and powerful in any society manipulate the system to serve their own self-interest and that as those with influence work to bend the arc of the universe toward privilege, the system is structured to favor the affluent to the detriment of the less advantaged. What we need to do is to try to remove those barriers and work in such a way that we are behaving consistent with Isaiah's words to the people of Israel. that the kind of fasting and behavior that we're involved in call us to free those who are wrongly imprisoned and to stop oppressing those who work for us, that we treat people fairly and give them what they earn, that we share our food with the hungry and welcome the poor into our homes and giving clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need our help. Now, too often, however, that sounds like charity. And I want to suggest that charity is one aspect of doing justice, but it is not justice completely. Unless we move and work toward changing the status quo that produces the injustice to begin with, then we are not working to the full extent of what the prophet Micah calls us to to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. 
God bless you.